All right, good morning and thank you. So what I would like to try to do today is talk about some of the observations that we've made of tsunamis in the past decade um, with a strong focus on ports and harbors, how those observations have motivated laboratory work, how they've motivated numerical work, and how the products of those studies have slowly filtered their way into some policy deci decisions in California. So it's been a big group here um, at USC and uh, throughout the state. Um, and, and I'm also, when I talk about observations, I'm going to show uh, pictures from not just our group, but from other groups who have uh, gone out in the field. So again, what I'd like to try to do, uh, review those observations and talk about the, the studies that they have inspired and how those studies have really changed the way that we look at ports and harbors. Um, so I'm going to go through a quick tsunami background. I know a lot of us in this room do not know very much about tsunamis. I'm going to talk about uh, the difference between the height of the tsunami and the current of the tsunami, why we care about tsunami current. I'll go through observations, and then I'll go through the efforts towards uh, engineering analysis for mitigation. All right, so I start with where the tsunami begins. So the way that we generate a tsunami when we talk about seismic tsunamis is we specify an earthquake somewhere. And so um, what becomes very important for us, is this my pointer? Um, we specify an earthquake somewhere. So for example, we can put a large earthquake on the uh, Alaska Aleutian subduction zone. Um, and what becomes very important for us when we talk about tsunamis is the distribution of that slip, okay? Because that slip distribution controls the amplitude of the tsunami at generation. And still in our field, um, how we distribute that slip for a given earthquake, for a given tsunami, is one of our largest sources of uncertainty. It drives the hazard to a very large degree for a near-field tsunami, and on the earthquake characterization side, it's still something that needs quite a bit of work. Once we have that slip distribution, we can use some, some theory to turn that into a tsunami initial condition, then we use our wave equations to propagate that across any basin. So this is really the basic of of how we handle tsunami. Um, when we talk about near field effects, we bring that a little bit closer. We look at how the tsunami interacts with coastal structures. And so this is a simulation of a tsunami at the port of LA and Long Beach, um, if any of you are familiar with that. And what you're looking at right now is the elevation of the wave with a color scale given over here by the color bar in meters. So the low, the cold blues represent the trough of the wave, the, the the hot reds indicate the crest. Um, and what you see as the wave comes in is that all these individual basins start to slosh and resonate at their own pace or their own frequency, but not necessarily in phase with all of the other basins around them. And so you have the same sort of behavior in a structure where different structures resonate at different frequencies. All these individual basins start to resonate at their own individual frequency. So we call this kind of the, the Christmas tree light, right? So they're all flashing on and off. Um, I show this first just to give you the scale of change, spatial scales of change when we talk about water surface elevation for a tsunami. When we switch to the current underneath that wave, what you'll see is that the scale of change is much, much smaller, okay? And so as the water starts to funnel through these gates and comes around the corner, you get these jets, you get these very strong amplifications of flow, which means that if you have a, a damage or an impact that's driven by the current, you have these very localized hotspots. And it turns out that that is what you see when you go out in the field. You see areas where the current was large and you see very high intensification of the damage. It's also important to keep in mind that during a tsunami, the, the speed you know, relative to a tornado might not be that large. So in a case like this, we're looking at currents in the order of um, five-ish meters per second, so 10 miles per hour. But when you think about the force on that object, if it's a drag, uh, a drag or a submerged object, you go back to your undergraduate fluid mechanics, the drag force on an object with water moving at 10 miles an hour is equal to the drag force on that same object in air moving at 300 miles an hour, right? So water is really, really heavy. And so when it, mo when it moves quickly, you have a very high potential for damage. All right, so I'm gonna go through some observations relatively quickly and I'm gonna cut myself off at 2010 and I'll move forward and I'll focus on just a few, not all of them, there have been a number of them, um, with a particular uh, focus on ports and harbors. Um, so I'll go to 2010 in Chile, 
relatively large earthquake, there was a lot of impact to ports and harbors, uh, large ports, uh, to small harbors. Um, when you went in the field, you saw uh, damage both from the tsunami and from the earthquake. So this is an example of seismically induced liquefaction, which the tsunami then came in and washed away some of that soil. And so you see a lot of the failure on the wharf. Um, and so I'll give credit to, to Ian for a number of these pictures as I go through the first two events. So he was in the field for a lot of these situations and he took a number of these pictures. Uh, we talk about effects in ports. Cargo containers, especially if they're not filled, they float very, very easily. As soon as they start to float, they move with the speed of the water and they become relatively heavy debris objects, which then cascade and cause additional damage. Um, and you can see as they start to impact objects, you have that crushing effect. And so um, uh, in the 2000s, uh, Clay Nato at Lehigh did a bunch of work looking at these objects to try to characterize how they impact. And so that's also become very useful. So the, these pictures are from uh, Ian Robertson and Gary Chalk. Um, Gary gave me a bunch of these pictures. Um, and so I believe this was part of an ASC survey in 2010. Um, when we talk about harbors, we talk about ships being pulled off their mooring lines. And so this is something we started to see quite a bit in major ports. You, you would see ships lashed together. So these three ships are, were tied together and then this last ship was connected to a dock. So what happens is that the lines that are connecting this last ship to the dock are just your ordinary lines as if you had one ship. But you have three ships in the water so you have three times the drag force. Right, and so those lines start to pull off pretty quickly and then these ships start to float as one. Um, and so you've easily overwhelmed your mooring system. It's an easy mitigation option during a tsunami. Don't tie ships together. Um, a great example of the force that you have both on the current side and the buoyancy side. So um, this is a ship, if you can't tell what this is, this is a bollard, right? So the ship was moored to that steel bollard this is the concrete foundation that the bollard was installed in. So quite literally the tsunami just pulled it out of the wharf and carried with it. So it gives you an idea of the amount of force that you have here. You know, it's hard to tell um, the strength of that. Maybe it was sitting in sand, I don't really know. But it was enough to pull it and drag it. And that ship becomes now a floating debris object which can impact into other things. We move ahead to Japan. Um, Many ports suffered some damage and a lot of small craft vessels were out of service. I'll focus here on Sendai because it's a major port. Um, a picture of Sendai post tsunami. If we uh, flip this over and look from above, so this is Sendai on that side pre-tsunami. You see the container terminal over here and part of the port. The port extends further inland and up. Um, and I show this just to give you an idea of almost how binary the structural damage is and also to give you an idea of what happens to these containers in the tsunami. So focus on the containers, focus on the landform change as I go to the next slide and focus on how these residential houses did during the tsunami. So if I switch forward, um, all those residential structures are gone. Some of the larger uh, buildings in the port um, are, are uh, washed through and, and scraped on the inside, but this is what the containers look like, right? So it's very, very classic post tsunami image of a container terminal um, where you had substantial flooding. So to the credit of the Japanese, this container terminal was at least partially back in operation a few weeks after the event and they were starting to bring in supplies. Inside Sendai, you saw this uh, issue of very large debris. Um, here being a large ship. And so this was pulled off its mooring lines and floated. The mass on these ships is tremendous. Even if they're not moving fast, whatever they hit, that object is going to lose. And so you see here some damage to a, a crane that was on rails. Um, you see the, the, the ship impacting into a warehouse, causing additional damage. Um, and a close up on that damage right there. Similar in a similar situation in a different port, one single ship pulled off its mooring lines, impacted into a warehouse, knocked out bits of the foundation. You get an idea of the force of that ship as it just carved its way through part of the walkway. Um, you see that damage right here. I think, is that you, Ian? Yeah, yeah that's Ian. Um, 
Far field example from 2011 um, in Guam Naval Harbor. Uh, this particular harbor, they were told a tsunami was coming and they purposefully moved two of their naval submarines into this area, which is an area that is traditionally very much protected during typhoons. During a tsunami, the opposite happens. So they, they tied them together, they lashed them together. The tsunami flow came in through this channel. It started to rotate here. You have submarines, they're submerged. There's a very large um, exposed area for that drag force. They start to rotate, they easily pull their mooring lines off, and for about 30 minutes in 2011, you had two nuclear subs floating around the naval harbor of Guam, not under control. One of them damaged the rudder, they eventually got both of them under control, but this actually happened. You didn't really hear too much about it because it was a relatively small event in the context of Japan. This happened with a 30 centimeter tsunami, right? So foot-high tsunami, not even the range of the tides, created enough localized currents to, to, to pull two nuclear submarines off their mooring lines. Um, talking about response to a tsunami, so in uh, 2015, you had a large earthquake in northern Chile. So this happened, this, you know, David talks about things that we love to do. So this was fun for, for our group. So it was a large earthquake. It happened at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon Pacific time. By about 5.30, we knew that there was a large tsunami generated in Chile, but it was going to be a relatively small far field event. And so we spent a lot of time doing modeling in California. We looked at the source likely effects on our harbors in California. We said, well, here in Ventura Harbor, which is near where we are in LA, is going to have about a foot size wave, but we expect the currents to be fairly significant. So we got together. We opened our closet to see what sort of equipment we had, and we figured out that we could get enough equipment and people together so that we could drive out to Ventura Harbor in about five hours, lay some equipment down, and do a field campaign during the event. Um, and so what we did was not all that sophisticated because we didn't have a lot of time. Um, there's no good community mechanism for this sort of response, where your response, you have six hours, and it's in the middle of the night. Um, so we set up a camera. At this point, uh, a nice camera with a um, um, uh, uh, SLR-type camera, and we had um, objects, which we would quite literally just put into the water, and we would be able to track them on the camera. And so this particular tsunami, we call it like a Goldilocks tsunami, because the tsunami was big enough to create currents that were of interest to us and could be measured, but they weren't strong enough for it to be dangerous. So we could actually be in the water and near the water at the time while we were measuring it. Um, and so there were other cameras here, but it turned out that was really the only one that we needed. And so this is what the time lapse of that particular event looks like. Um, if you look closely, you can kind of see the washing in and out of tsunami currents. You also see that the harbor was not closed because people are coming in and out with their boats. Um, and so we have this imagery. We went back the next day with our RTK and we surveyed in a whole bunch of control points. So we rectified, geo-rectified that image and you wind up with something like this from above. And so this is an image of the currents that happened during the day and every now and then you'll see like a white blob pass through and those are our tracers, the things that look like Vs shooting by are the actual boats. Um, and so, so those are our tracers. Um, and so you digitize those, you trace them out, and what you have is a time series of velocity in the harbor channel during the event. Right? So this sort of data is extremely rare in our community. There's a huge lack of hazard data. Um, there's a lot of impact data. We don't have a lot of hazard, impact, ha hazard data. And so this um, is relatively unique, and it's something that we've used both to motivate what we need to look at a little bit more, but also to validate models. Um, when we look at uh, these currents in ports and harbors, we always see this rotation. And so that motivation said, well, let's go to the lab and let's do this good, classic fluid mechanics vorticity study and try to create one of these large rotational features at a scale um, that, that is relevant to harbors. And so what we did is we went to OSU. We created a wave that pushed forward through this breakwater gap and then pulled back, and so what you wind up getting is a strong jet of water coming through that gap, and you create this very large eddy. So if you're familiar with the OSU wave basin, this scale right here in the up and down is about 20 meters. This is a big tank. 
And so this is a very, very large rotational structure. It's about 20 meters in diameter and a water depth of about 50 centimeters. So it's really a shallow rotational feature, just like a tsunami. We have all sorts of fun with that. We digitize these particles to get velocities. We also did other visualizations to get an idea of what the dynamics are like. So if you're a mechanician and you're into vorticity, this is like, this is total eye candy, right? Because you, you can see how those vort vorticity filaments get pulled into the core and they get stretched. So these are the sort of things that we love to do on the, the basic science side. Um, you bring all this data together and you wind up with a really detailed characterization of the flow around one of these eddies. And then you use this to validate models. Once you validate those models, then you can start applying them to geophysical scale and you can start making them a little bit more complicated. So for example, um, you can look at the motion of large ships in a harbor. You can couple those together. So the very, very much motivated by the observations we've made to see where that ship might go, what it might impact it to. We can also look at smaller debris to get an idea of where these debris fields may wind up and how they may change the loads on structures as they get infected through. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about that, but this is where we go, right? We get all this data, we bring it to the models, we have some idea that our models are reliable, and then we start applying the models to real problems. Okay, and so this is going back to that first animation I showed you with the currents in the port of LA Long Beach. And so this is just the maximum current map. And so with this, you can very, very clearly see where these current hotspots are. They're right where the water starts to constrict, constrict through these entrances. Okay, so what we've done with the state is we've taken these sorts of model results and we've turned them into products that are easily readily, easily digestible by stakeholders. And one of the first things we did was to take that complex color map type and divide it into just three different colors, right? And so what we did is we divided it into areas where we expected to have minor to moderate, moderate to major, and major damage. And we chose those categories based on observations. So this is the post event. You go to the field and you create a damage index, which I'm not gonna talk about, low damage to high damage, and then you connect that with speed, um, both from measurements and simulations, and you wind up with a scatter plot like this given by these red dots, okay? Very, very simple damage curve. For our first cut, we simply divided it into, well, four bins, including no damage, but three bins, um, where you have these not bins giving you likely damage levels. And it turned out this was really simple, but it was really useful. So we have people using these bins throughout the world now when they do the first order characterization of hot spots inside ports and harbors. But what is also obvious when you look at this is that these points have a huge spread on them. And that spread is related to the exposure and the vulnerability of the harbor, right? So if I look at these red points and I follow the, this green line on the bottom, these are harbors that had relatively low damage with high current, meaning they were resilient, they were strong. Along the yellow line, it means that they had high damage at those same currents, right? So what always happens in these events is the harbor exists up here on the yellow line, it gets destroyed, they rebuild, and hopefully they're on the green line. So you go to it and you say, well, can we help these harbors get themselves down to the green line before they're destroyed, right? And so that's much of our motivation, trying to give them recommendations. One way we did this was to do a good old engineering analysis, a demand capacity approach with some uncertainties in your Monte Carlo with some fragility to get an idea of where in the harbor you're likely to have impacts or damage first. Um, what we found from, again, our post-event observations is that damage in harbors, particularly small craft harbors, starts when pile guides and cleats fail. Those are the first things to go. When the cleat fails, the boat becomes free. It impacts into the docks, it impacts into other boats, and you get the damage cascade. When pile guides fail, the docks get locked onto the pile, they get stuck, they break, they become free. That debris also causes other failure. And so what you have to do is you then have to go to all these individual harbors in California and you have to take an inventory of the deterioration state of these individual components. 
Some harbors welcome you with open arms. They help us. Other harbors say, just, we don't want to know, go away, don't even include us in your analysis. So we were actually down in Southern California doing this yesterday, and it is really binary, the types of different responses you get. Well, once you do that and you go through the analysis, you wind up defining these different zones. So this is Santa Cruz. And for different scenarios, you can specify relatively high likelihood of damage, relatively low likelihood of damage. And so when these harbors then have resources to go do mitigation or repair, they can target those areas. Because it's not likely that any individual harbor has enough money to redo large parts of their harbor at once, but they often have money to do small parts at once. And so this sort of information helps them. And so all this information that we've put together over the past few years with the state have gone into two major products. The first is being what we call playbooks. And so during an event, all these modeling results have gone into these booklets that the individual harbors reference during an event for particular scenarios. So a, an event happens, they're told to look at scenario B, they go to the scenario B page and it gives them a very, very quick idea of what the impacts are likely to be in their harbor and it allows them to do planning the day of. The other one, which is a little bit more on the engineering side, are these harbor improvement reports, which uh, includes this, this simple engineering analysis with a whole bunch of mitigation options. And so our hope for this was that we give these to the harbors. It gives them an idea of what is needed, and we're helping them write grants, particularly through some of the disaster money that's come into the state, to get some money and go into their harbors and make them more resilient, make them stronger, so that they're less likely to have substantial impacts during the next event. All right, so I think I will end there. Thank you.